How long have we been human? We've been people for 300,000 years. How long have we had farming or agriculture? Maybe 10,000 years or so. But before then, we all hunted, we all fished, we all gathered. When Poverty Point was finished being created 3,100 years ago, there is not a single greater set of mounds or earthworks anywhere in North America. It was built by people we nominally think of as hunter-gatherers who didn't have what we assume to be the benefits of agriculture, which really in one sense are time. Even today, Mound A is most likely the single greatest monument created by hunters and gatherers in the world. So we've got people who shouldn't be doing this, doing it. And those things coming together become really important. Starting roughly 3,700 years ago, there was community. And over the next roughly 600 years, as we know so far, they created mounds and earthworks and monuments. They started with Mound B and then started to add monuments over time. So you have mounds B first, and then E, and then you have C built sometime in the period in the plaza. Mound A being the last and largest of the mounds, and then Mound F at the very end of the period. Now, those are just the mounds. The people also created six semi-elliptical or semi-oval earthworks or ridges, and these surrounded a central plaza. So the central plaza being about 43 acres, and it's built like everything else. It's, it's terraformed, it's constructed fill, as we're coming to learn. There is even a part of the site that we call the dock, which is on the eastern edge of the site, and it is next to or abuts the, the Bayou Mason, and that is likely where people would come to the site for the first time. Beach their dugout canoes or what have you, walk up the edge of the, the dock itself into the plaza, and then you would see this artificial space that surrounds you, you would see timber circles that were constructed inside the plaza. It's not just earthworks, they're building wooden structures like this. Sometimes um, some of these structures were 60 meters or more in diameter. Surrounding that, you have the ridges we described. To the best of our knowledge, the ridges were occupational space. Over 90% of all the cultural material, all the artifacts, are found concentrated on the tops, on the insides, and even underneath the ridges we find evidence of occupational zones. And then beyond are the largest of the mounds. The, the question that I ask is, were people living at the site for prolonged periods of time? Was it a place where a family came, reproduced, you know, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, etc.? I think the evidence is very equivocal at, at best. So the ridges, the C-shaped ridges, were places where there was lots of activity happening. The quantity of artifacts is, is really, truly staggering. So they're definitely there, they're doing something on them. I don't see the evidence that they're doing that for prolonged periods of time. The material culture at Poverty Point is really extraordinarily diverse. It's diverse in its sources of origins from, you know, different places. It's diverse in the qualities of it, because there's material there that's not found literally anywhere else. So there is at least 16 different styles of projectile points. So the chipped stone points that tip the ends of their spears, their darts, their knives, and all their other uh, tools. We can find ground stone celts or stone axes that were used to chop down trees to create their posts, their structures, 
to have wood to fuel their fires, cook their food, heat their homes. We find tens and tens of thousands of microblades, lamellar blades that were used to shape animal hides most likely, along with artifacts that we call perforators. And we're not entirely sure what they're used for, but they seem to be ubiquitous with the Poverty Point culture. But even more ubiquitous than even these lithics or stone artifacts are the Poverty Point objects themselves. A Poverty Point object is a shaped earthen ceramic ball that in most cases was likely heated to cook food. But Poverty Point exists in a stone-free area. On all these ancient sites, we see FCR, firecracked rock, and we see it at Poverty Point too, but it looks like they're using these PPOs in order to replace rocks to cook for hundreds if not thousands of people. So we think of hunter-gatherers as being in small groups. They have little to no sort of political structure and, and organization. Um, they're spending a lot of their time, understandably, getting food from nature. If you flip the switch or the script and you say, let's look at it from an economic perspective. Let's be very rational. Let's think about it from an energetic perspective. Let's think about it from this sort of, you know, rational actor theory that people don't waste energy unnecessarily or anything like that. You would never put Poverty Point where Poverty Point is. There are thousands of more locations, some of them which are actually quite clearly nearby, where you put it. Vicksburg is where Poverty Point should be if you want to be at the intersection of the major river and it's 40 meters you know, above the Mississippi River, so never going to flood. That's not where Poverty Point ended up. If we think about this broad and very generalized native philosophical tenet, which is that you have relatedness, everybody and everything is related to one another, that you have moral responsibility of custodians, and that everything we is responsible for everything we, but we as humans have more agency to do this, then when things go awry, when that moral fabric gets torn in some way, it's incumbent on people to do something about it. And I think that that's an important thing, particularly when, when it comes to archaeology. Because if they do something, it means that they leave behind some residue of it. And what we're trying to think about in the context of a site like Poverty Point is that rather than seeing it as some kind of functional economic place, we're trying to see it in that relational universe. So somewhere between 3,500 and 3,300 years ago, we see this immense amount of climate change. Rivers aren't flowing, coastlines are changing, rains are, are, are falling or aren't falling, you know, all of these kinds of things. And Poverty Point and the building of Mound A happen in exactly that moment of major environmental change, of the world shifting in some visible way. And the building of Mound A happened, as best we can tell, extremely quickly. We can't prove that Mound A was not built in like 90 days or less. And it's extraordinary to think about that. It's an extraordinary amount of labor. And then there's the question of motivation and function. As best we can tell, nobody lived on top of Mound A. So it wasn't the house of a chief or a priest or anything like that. There are no artifacts around Mound A. They weren't having parties or feasts. So then you get at this question of, you know, what is it? We think that people are responding to real, seen, viewed, and experienced climate change. And they're saying, 
that web of creation is being pulled apart somehow, we have an obligation to mend it, to basically bring that cosmos back into to harmony and unity. And they do these things, and as best we can tell, they do them quickly, then they fundamentally walk away from the site. By 1100 BCE or so, we don't find any more evidence of the, the culture existing on site. So maybe people came and still use the site ceremonially only, uh, but they're not leaving a footprint on this uh, artificial landscape. And so what we had seen as a collapse originally, and a collapse is one of these terms that says, you know, you went from this state suddenly to this state, I don't see it so much as a collapse, as a, as a sort of reworking of our relationship with the environment. And a lot of it does require you to behave differently. At Poverty Point, though, people walk away and do not come back. And my colleague, Maggie Spivey Faulkner, who's a member of the PD Nation, she talks about this as a curated absence. She says, this is a meaningful place. It's a place that is part of revelation and you don't come back and do anything there because you're keeping it curated. You're keeping it empty because it's holy ground. Poverty Point shows us that our ancestors who lived this way could do great things. Poverty Point is absolutely unique. It's unique in space, time, place, content, the whole everything. The incredible level of social sophistication, the size and scale of the earthworks, the exchange that these people created, it's a, it's a phenomenon in and of itself. This is one reason why I think thinking differently about Poverty Point is important, because it is different. It's not just like an oversized town. It is something different. Archaeology and science isn't a set of facts and figures. It is only a process. We are in a point in the process where we have more information than we had a decade ago. And another decade, we might shift old perspectives in different places and create a, a new map of what this place was. The moment I love as someone who's now towards the end of his career is that I'm realizing that my responsibility, my custodial responsibility, is to be sensitive to a different story and to work with people for whom this story is about.